Now you had to have prior knowledge that if I put my hand here, something will happen to me and I will need to release my hand. It is that knowledge that keeps your security of life. My people perish. And I've told people again that you can belong to God and still perish. Think about it. My people. It would have been better if my was not in that statement. Because then it would have been forceful. We can force it on when you're not born again. But when my is introduced to that verse, it makes that verse very dangerous and different. So he is coming slowly. He is unlocking. So give it time. Are you hearing me? Now, if this verse read it like this, remove my and read it if you can. People are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Don't you think that would be fair? Because then the argument is, if you are not born again. But you see, the word my changes the dynamics of this scripture. It explains to you that the worst thing that you can ever think of, and this is what guarantees that once saved, always saved is a lie. Because then here, how can you be his and still you are suffering destruction? Think about my question. I mean, if it's my people, the fact that those two words are enough, my people, it means the next thing that should follow there is not destroyed. Do you hear what I'm saying? So on the account of that, salvation is as permanent as the one that received you by the promise and you that accepted him. It's not just him that received you. It's you that accepted him. So when you teach salvation, uh, it's once and always. It is lazy people that can embrace that because they have forgotten the context of work your salvation. Work out your salvation. So then the question is, in case I don't work out my salvation, what do I stand to lose in the absence of my working? What do I stand to lose? Can I tell you? Your spirit, your soul. That's what you stand to lose. And Paul was very clear about the new Jerusalem and the kind of people that will inherit it. It's not just people that say, Lord, Lord, that will inherit the kingdom of heaven. So this scripture here says, my people are destroyed. So it's possible to belong to God and still suffer distraction. Do you hear what I'm saying? So let us not be carried away. And by the way, this is not subject to debate. There is nothing to debate here. Some things, even if you hear a minister say, just go study your Bible for yourself. From God's side, God will never leave you. That is on God. I will never, not we will never leave each other. You are not listening. The Bible did not say we will never leave each other. It says I. He can only speak for himself. But you see the problem is in a marriage, I'm not I, it is we. So me, I can tell my wife, I will never leave you. But her, she will need to, to tell me she will never leave me. Now this is how it works. That you can say, God can, will tell you from God's perspective, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That is God. Now you too must apply the same dynamics that you must get to a mature place where you too will never leave him and never forsake him peter left and peter forsake so it's a perspective that can happen and the only person who, through which there is guarantee of that scripture is god only because he is the only one that is faithful able to keep his word to the latter but me and you are we are subject to change and that's why today you feel, tomorrow you don't feel. God doesn't feel today and feel tomorrow. God does not operate and is not controlled by a feeling. He has exalted his word. God is controlled by his own word. His belief system cannot be anchored on emotional boundaries. Because then that will make God very dangerous. Because if God is controlled by emotion, look at the way you, you are behaving with emotions. You see, you have killed everyone. Can you imagine if God would decide to, from today, my emotion, my emotion, my emotions? Who would be alive to tell the story of emotions? So God is superior to what you call the emotions. And so it's very important that we... You're not listening. I 
I will never leave you. That is God. Don't take that scripture and um, um, delete your part in this. And I've told you time and again, John 3.16, put it. This is the best way to read the Bible. You know, it took me many years, not by practice or works, lest any man should boast. No, that is the biggest lie I can ever say. But it took me many years for me to say that, um, to understand this word. Now, can we read it? For God. Uh -huh. Is that a full stop or a comma? So is that the end? So is this scripture ending with sun or it's continuing? So this is how you teach grace. Grace is twofold. What God has done and what you ought to do. Part of it is offer your body. That's not God. It never read, I will take your body. It is offer your body. Do your part by your own self because I've done my own part. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So it says, for God so loved the world. So the character that has been brought into this system is who? God. The first character of John 3.16 is who? What's his name? God. Are you seeing him? So love the world. That is on God. Your prayer didn't make God to love the world. Your prayer didn't make God God. So at that particular point, you are irrelevant. Your prayer did not bring Jesus. That's how you read the Bible. You don't read it in a hurry so that you can say, today I read four chapters. What did you understand? You'd rather read one and understand everything. So that is on God. And this is John 3.16. A little simple verse, but I can guarantee you many people have not come into contact with the reality of this verse. For God so loved the world that he, you still see it's a function of he. God and he gave. So God giving Jesus has nothing to do with a prophetic meeting. It has nothing to do with an apostolic system. It has nothing to do with an evangelistic. It has nothing to do with your prayer. All this is on God. Your part has not yet come. But John 3.16 has two parts when salvation is involved. There are two parts. There are two arms to salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's, now he says, comma, not full stop. It means the verse has not finished. The love angle has not yet been fully written. He says that whosoever, look, whosoever, underline the word is, believe. So there is a condition to this love. You must believe it. <laughs> as powerful as this love is, if a man rejects it, this love has no place in his heart. So God can only come so far and expect, let me explain. Can I come down again? Jay, come. Stop there. Stand and stop there kindly. This is me, and this is my throne. And I just use the metaphor of sitting because that's the best we have. So I don't want to really explain Stephen. And he saw the Son of Man standing. Then you will understand God sits while standing. I don't have even the time to tell you that. Will you understand? You want to woo me so that I say, hey, waki mungu muguze tu atuambi. That's no. I don't have time to explain. That's why I've explained sitting in heaven. It's not sitting using your behind. Stephen explained to us the sitting position of God. He saw the son of man standing. Sitting is a function of rest, not behind touching something. <laughs> You are not listening. Why don't you listen? Let's not go there. Just know it's a function of rest. When you sit, you have rested. So he saw the son of man standing, but he's already in his rest, Sabbath. It's not my teaching. So, to go there, no more. Thank God I just care. But anyway, this is Jay. This is my throne. And I've explained, I don't have time. Or maybe should I teach? I give you like three. No. So this is sitting in a metaphor. For God so loved the world 
who is assuming I'm God and he's the man. God so loved the world. His man praying about God to love the world. That he gave his only begotten son. His man even aware that he's a son. That was put comma there. This is what it means. God so loved the world. God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. So he couldn't come a hundred. He came and then he moved to a certain location. And then now he expects you to come to him. The best person that explained John 3.16 is not John. It's Peter. That's like John 3.16. Father, if it is you, not come for me. There's a secret place I found. He's living inside me. He knew I live and move and have my being. Yeshua, oh. Yeshua, oh. There's a secret one I found. He's living inside me. In you I live and move and have my being. Agaba, oh, Agaba. Agaba, oh, Agaba. Agaba, oh, Agaba. Agaba, oh, Agaba. Yeshua, oh, Yeshua. Yeshua, oh, Yeshua, Yeshua, oh, Yeshua, Yeshua, oh, Yeshua, Yeshua, oh, Yeshua, there's a secret place I found. So don't forget it. I thought as I knew God, he was going to make it easier for me to teach. But I've learned it's the opposite. When you begin to know God, he wants you to spend time with him. So he makes it hard for you to spend time outside him. So Peter is the one that wrote John 3.16 practically. You're not listening. Then John wrote John 3.16 theoretically. So the theoretical angle to John 3.16 is by John's writing. The practical angle of John 3.16 is Peter. Have you understood it? So Peter could only come to a point where they can see him. Jesus, sorry. That they can see Jesus. He will only come... To that point where you can pick him and then stop because that is what salvation is about father if it is you bid me meanwhile remember that there were storms and the boat was capsizing in other words bring me to yourself give me your life Jesus did not do this are you hearing me he came only to that point where they can see him then he stopped and that's 90, for example. And then he says, salvation is I come and stand at the door and knock. But you must open. Now, do you understand the context of... Why are you not understanding? That's the context of salvation. So any man that teaches salvation from the finished works of Jesus Christ without... In my, you're not listening. That I'm coming back my reward is with me and i will give according to what you not jesus did that is what you call salvation and john 3 16 explains to us the reality of a born again man it is a man that has seen jesus and has come to jesus so many of us we have seen him but you're not willing to come because you already know it will cost you 
some private things. And so you keep seeing him. No wonder you are crying during service. But you're not willing to step out of the boat. You're not willing. And this is the context of salvation. Have you understood it? 